last week we started a conversation, I titled the message Commission. And I robbed it from Matthew 28, where we get the phrase within church world or Christianity, the Great Commission. And we found this in Matthew 28, verses 18, 19, and 20. There's, there's powerful statements being declared in these three verses. It starts off with Jesus saying that all authority on, in heaven and on earth has been given to him. I said it last week, so you know that where I'm going to go with this. If Jesus has all authority, how much authority is left for a devil? Zero. Zero. Just remember that when you're feeling overwhelmed. He has no authority. Jesus has taken all authority. So then he also says that uh, we are to go. That means we have been released to go, making disciples, teaching people uh, all of the things that we've experienced. So you can't give what you don't have. So we need to make sure that we're experiencing the things of God so that we're able to go and be disciple makers. And uh, I made of kind of some fun, funny out of the, 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 the fact that two-thirds of God's name is go. So we're called to go in beyond our weekend experiences. And then it says that uh, he has commanded us. This word command is a, it's a military term. It's actually where a, an officer would be commissioned, given that authority, delegated authority to accomplish or lead what he's been tasked to do. And finally, Jesus says, lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And so that was our launching point for commissioned. And today, where I want to talk is uh, a topic or a, a message or sermon that I've been gathering for, thinking about, praying about for literally years. I've, I've been gathering nuggets and thoughts and putting them together. And so today, uh, it's, it's kind of like that soda can that's been shook up. And if you're in the front row, you're really going to get, you're going to get wet because um, this is important. Jesus commissioned us to go. That means to bring the light of the gospel to every person. That's our venues, where we live, um, where we work, where we do commerce. But how we go and what we do is so important. It is who we're becoming, how we're interacting. It's the expression of the Father. He's, you know, he's taking a pretty big risk on us to represent him. You know, we carry the name of Jesus, and he's commissioned us to go, and how we go, what we do, and what we say is a big deal. It's a really big deal. So I was thinking about my, my upbringing. I started working for my parents around the age of 12, and so I have early memories of being in a panel shop terminating wires, and then as they, they bought another business, I started wrenching on snowmobiles and quads and um, getting more mechanical. And then in my adult life, I, I entered the trades, and I had the privilege of working in several different environments from heat treat environments, to stamping environments, to centered metals, to biotechnology, to bottling facilities. I was either employed by companies or subcontracted to go in and work on things. And here's, here's what I discovered in the trades, that there were two types of experts out there. The first type of expert was the individual who has worked for the company from the beginning. And they were an expert because of their longevity and exposure and saturation to the equipment and technology inside their facility. And, and uh, what I discovered is that they were pretty territorial because they knew how important they were to the company and they weren't afraid to tell you. They were experts. They knew the stuff because of pure saturation to what they saw. Second type of expert is the individual who could take the ability, skill set, troubleshooting of electrical mechanical uh, technologies in any environment and look across the room, no matter what type of technology we're talking about, whether it be robotics or automations or simple metal stamping, and realize it's all nuts and bolts and go in there with the confidence to be able to do and work on anything. And I discovered that in, the, in that world, there's a lot of similarities to the church. There are two types of experts that I found in the church world. Uh-oh. There are people that are so saturated by one denominational persuasion, one theory, one view, one theological thought. They are experts in what they know. Take them out of that environment and send them into the world, and they're lost they don't have the, the wherewithal, the words, the communication ability. I'm telling you from experience that I spent nearly 10 years serving with an organization or a, a denomination that we were told by our leaders, don't even read materials outside of our group because it'll just confuse you. 
And then I just facilitated that too. I told people that I was leading, hey, you don't want to read anything outside of our group. You, you, you really don't want to listen to that preacher or listen to her because if their church was growing, we, we, were, we, didn't, we wouldn't have used these words, but here's the reality. We were insecure, and so we had to find out reasons why they were, quote, unquote, watering it down. They, they must be that seeker-sensitive church. That, that's why they're growing. Can I just, let me just talk on that just for a moment. I didn't say this to the other services. What's so wrong about being seeker-sensitive? Just in the purity of the statement, we're actually being sensitive to those who are seeking the things of God? Is that wrong? Now, listen, don't catch me in the, in the comments area afterwards. I know what they mean when they say it. Okay, I get that. But don't just take a phrase and not break it down for a moment. I want to be sensitive and use words. I want to use conversations that no matter where you came from today, whether you are a lifelong church-attending Christian or you've come in here and you're nervous as all get out because you have no idea what these people are going to do. You have no idea what that guy on the platform is going to say. I I could pull out all my fancy seminary words, and I might sound super smart, at least to myself, right? (laughs) But if I'm not effective, what good is any of that? And so I'm going to tell you one of my biggest challenges, church, with dealing with Christians are people that are closed-minded. Closed-minded. And if that's you, please don't, don't tune me out yet. My, pr- my prayer for you all week is that I was going to persuade you to be open-minded tonight. To be closed-minded means that we've only focused on one thing. We, we get a box going, and we know the inside of the box so well. And if we're not careful, we, I've drifted into this space. That if you didn't think like, believe just like I did, not only were you wrong and I was right, I was going so far as calling people heretics. And I've, I, I've since, you know, reaped some of what I sowed because I remember sitting with a family after they heard me say one statement, one soundbite, without ever asking any more details, they came to me after church, actually they, they made an appointment and they said, Pastor Phil, um, I heard you say this. And I've never heard that taught before, and I don't believe that, so we're not going to attend here anymore. And so I'm like, well, hold hold the phone. That's that's okay that we don't see eye to eye. Let me ask you, please, what do you believe? What have you studied? What have you you seen? I'd love to have a conversation about that. And the reality is they hadn't. They hadn't studied anything else. It wasn't that they didn't believe it. They just have never been exposed to something new. And my journey as a pastor, no, let me take that back. My journey as a Christian has been just loaded with curiosity, asking questions, being open-minded. And so when you become a certain way, uh, you tend to think that everybody's going to be a certain way. Everybody's going to be okay having conversations and being tactful and being humble and not being mean-spirited. But it's just not, not true. So here, here's my, my opening statement. Once we have a fixed mindset, we stop studying to learn and only look for proof to protect our belief. At some point, we've all done that, okay? I know I've thrown myself into the category. I've done it. And I'm probably doing it in some areas of my life right now that I'm not even aware of. But I just, I want to say it again. Once we have a fixed mindset, we stop studying to learn and only look for proof to protect what we already believe. I read a book last month that, got, that, uh, that really began to, to help me with words on what I wanted to say today. Because I must talk to you Christians, those that are on a journey with Jesus. You know, one of our biggest challenges is, is this. We confuse our favorite flavor for God's favor. You, you've got your preference. If it were up to you, there'd be a certain song every week right? If it were up to you, there'd be a certain time frame that that long-winded preacher would, would cut it off, uh, or, or your particular pet theory, your philosophy, your theology, we've all got them. Be very careful to confuse your favorite flavor for God's favor on your life. I read this book. I'm going to go back into this. The book title was Think Again. I don't always mention the books that I read just because there's a lot of them. Um, I did have somebody ask me yesterday walking out if I would give my top 10 books uh, recommendations, and uh, I, I'd be glad to do that. In fact, I'm going to make time on, on the morning to write those down if you're ever curious about what I'm reading. Just, just know it's a wide variety, okay? But anyway, Adam Grant wrote this book called Think Again, and what, what I thought was entertaining was the, the, I love when intellectual people can say smart things without making me feel dumb. That, you know what I mean by that? 
So he's got this great depth of research. And one of the subtitles in one of the chapters, it said, uh, a preacher, prosecutor, politician, and a scientist walk into your mind. And I'm like, Say, what? Because I thought I'm one of those, like, a rabbi, a priest, and someone walk into a bar. You know, kind of like, that's kind of what he was playing on. So the subtitle was, a preacher, prosecutor, politician, and a scientist walk into your mind. And what he was doing is he was using that to describe the frame of minds that we enter into or our modes of thinking. He goes on to say, when we're in scientist mode, we refuse to let our ideas become ideologies. We don't start with answers or solutions. We lead with questions. I'm going to say that again. When we're in a scientist mode, we refuse to let our ideas become ideologies. We don't start with answers or solutions. We lead with questions. He goes on to say, thinking like a scientist involves more than just reacting with an open mind. It means actively being open-minded. This is the key part of this. It requires searching for reasons why we might be wrong not for reasons why we must be right. And then revising our views based on what we learn. I'm going to say that again. Thinking like a scientist involves more than just reacting with an open mind. It means actively being open-minded. It requires searching for reasons why we might be wrong, not just for reasons why we must be right. And revising our views based on what we learn. So then he goes down and breaks through or breaks out a little bit on what does it look like What are some symptoms if you break into these categories, these modes of thinking? And so I'll start with the preacher because I am one. When you begin to drift into a preacher mindset or mode, here's what it might look like. It's when we present our pet theories as gospel and treat thoughtful critique as sacrilege. When changing our minds is a mark of moral weakness. You might have slipped into preacher mode or preacher mindset of thinking when we present our pet theories as gospel and treat thoughtful critiques as sacrilege, when changing our minds is a mark of moral weakness. The second one was the politician mindset, a way or mode of thinking. Here's some of the symptom. When we allow our views to be swayed by popularity rather than accuracy. When we flip-flop in response to carrots and sticks. You may have drifted into a politician mindset or mode of thinking, when, you allow, when we allow our views to be swayed by popularity rather than accuracy, when we flip-flop in response to carrots and sticks. Can I just confess to you, out of all of the modes of mindsets and thinking, the one that I wrestle with the most, the one that wants to pull me in, is this one. And it's, it's not, probably not for what reasons you think. You see, I already confess that I'm an open-minded person. I'm curious. I used to live my life in a box, and so anyone who thought differently, I just discounted you. I would even say rotten things about you, uh, repeating what I was told without ever knowing anything about you. I can't, not, maybe not you specifically, but I was pretty cool to, you know, the first services that we did, but no, I'm kidding. I'm talking on a bigger scale, bigger scale. I would criticize pastors that I never met. I would quote as if I heard them say it, that I read their book and I never even met them. I know the first thing that they preached, but I just regurgitated what I heard. And so when I began to shift away from this way of thinking, I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to start with all the heretics because that's what they were in my mind. And I'm going to tell you, church, I spent more time crying reading their books because I was so floored and humbled by how real and authentic almost all of them were. So when you begin to study and look at things differently, there are things that I used to be able to teach in Scripture that I thought were so black and white that once you see them different. I, I can't teach it that way anymore. And here's the real challenge. This is the, the confession part for me. The battle that I have is mainstream Christianity, the popular opinions on certain things aren't always that accurate. And I know that if I speak or teach or preach on something that's outside of popularity, I run the risk of people leaving. I run the risk of people rejecting me, saying bad things about me, not even having conversations with me not finding out what they see or what they think or what they've been studying, you know, and and take it even to another level. I mean, this is my livelihood. So it's so tempting to stay in a safe spot. 
I don't know if any of you can, can, can relate to anything that I just said, but I'm just being real with you. The third one, the third mindset, the mode of thinking that you might have slipped into is that prosecutor mindset. It's when you're bent on debunking and discrediting rather than discovering. If being persuaded feels like admitting defeat. You might have slipped into that prosecutor mindset when you're bent on debunking and discrediting rather than discovering if being persuaded feels like admitting that you're defeated. Our culture, church, our heritage comes through the, the Hebrew culture. And I want to submit to you today that the Hebrew culture, the Hebrew way, is the scientist mode of thinking. Rabbi uh, Jonathan Sachs said this, Judaism is the rarest of phenomena. It's a faith based on asking questions and sometimes deep and difficult ones that seem to shake the very foundations of faith itself. He goes on to say, Judaism is not a religion of blind obedience. Instead, astonishingly, in a religion of 613 commandments, there is no Hebrew word that means, quote unquote, to obey. When Hebrew was revived as a living language in the 19th century and there was a need for a verb meaning to obey, it had to be borrowed from the Aramaic language, a word uh, pronounced lel teset. Instead of a word meaning to obey, the Torah uses the verb shema or shama, untranslated into English because it means to listen, to hear, to understand, to internalize, and finally to respond. It's the Hebrew way, it's the rabbi way of asking questions. As I mentioned, I started this, this series, uh, The Great Commission, I'm calling it Commission, and I based it off from where we get that phrase, Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20. Interestingly enough, though, the preceding verses up to that encounter reveal something that I think that we, we need to, to, to look at. Look at Matthew 28, 16, and 17. Then the 11 disciples. Judas is gone. These are the 11 that traveled with Jesus. This is his, his ministry team. The 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some, some what? Doubted. Say what? The 11? They spent years, day in, day out, seeing all the miracles seeing everything that had happened, seeing Jesus crucified, then seeing him resurrected, these 11 came, some worshiped and some doubted? I'm going to say this. It is my opinion that doubt, note for sure, is your greatest enemy. As a believer, as a Christian, as someone who's following Jesus, doubt is absolutely your biggest enemy. It's not the Satan. It's doubt and unbelief. It's what we wrestle through. But I've also discovered this. Doubt has often been my friend. Why would I say that? Because simply this, sometimes doubt is a doorway to a better faith. Maybe you're, maybe you're right now, you're wrestling with some things. You're, you're questioning and it feels like doubt. And we've not done a good job in church world. And we pastors have not done a great job of encouraging you to, to push back a little bit. There's some of the most insecure people on the planet are preachers, meaning that we, we want to be able to feel like we know this stuff. And if someone asks a question, they can feel like you're threatening my knowledge or you're, you're threatening what, I, what I'm trying to accomplish here. And I just say this, I welcome questions. Just do so with tact. Do so with humility. And also let me ask you questions. I don't want to be interrogated any more than you want to be interrogated. But if there's something that's said, something that doesn't sound just right, if there's a tradition that you're now questioning, if you're wondering as you look at the fruit of something that we've been teaching for years or centuries and it's not working out, maybe that doubt is leading you to some better investigation, a better kind of faith and experience. That's been my journey. It's been my journey of, of, of asking why and where did we get this? Is there even scripture around that? How did this begin, and how old is this thought? How long have Christians been pursuing this? Did the early church, did Jesus talk about this? Did the, the, is there any history that helps us to understand? These lead to a very authentic Christian experience. The rabbi tradition, as I mentioned, is a one established, celebrated 
on questions. When a young person was finishing the Bet Talmud, which is the, 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 the study of the book, and they were getting qualified, whether they were going to go into the, to the, the ministry, a rabbi would come and start drilling them with questions. And the rabbi did not score these young people on how good they could answer the questions. The rabbi scored these young people on how quality of a question they could ask back. It was, it was, it was, it was an implication of their, of their understanding and their knowledge. Just look at Jesus. He was a rabbi. How many times was Jesus asked a point, point blank question and he didn't give a point blank answer? He almost always rebutted with a question. Just in case you wondered, I don't think Jesus didn't know the answers. It was the rabbi way. So let me, let me lay a little bit of a foundation here because I don't, I don't want to assume anything. I don't want to assume that, that these words, these phrases land on everybody's ears the same. And so I want to define three things for you. I want to define what Scripture says about Christ, about His church, and about Christianity. What the Scriptures say about Christ about his church, that's you and I, the ecclesia, and Christianity. Let's start with, with Christ. Christ is the Word of God, the eternal logos, assuming human flesh in Jesus of Nazareth. To rightfully say, I'm standing on the Word of God, it's more accurate to say that it's Jesus than the book of Scriptures. I know that's going to possibly get me in trouble for telling you that or saying that. But just so you know, your pastor loves the Bible. Okay? You see what I did there? I assumed that everyone here is going to stay here. I called you. you know, I'm your pastor. Anyway, um, <laughs> I love the Bible, but I don't love the Bible more than Jesus. I've said that before, and I'll continue to say that. The church, that's you, that's me, is the gathered community of the baptized, of, uh, the baptized who confess that Jesus is the Lord and believe that Jesus is the truth of God revealed in human life. You know, you are the body. He is the head. Before we discredit or discount the value of church, you should be reminded that the church was Jesus' idea. Before you start talking bad about his body, you should know that it belongs to the head of the church. The church is important. What we do is important. I believe that the church is the light under the world. And I believe that what we're doing here, building community, is super valuable. Christianity is the religion of beliefs and practices about Jesus Christ developed by the church. Now, have you ever said this phrase? Christianity isn't a religion, it's a relationship. I've said that. But I just want to push back a little bit. It's technically a religion. It's a tradition that we follow. We call it Christianity, and that's okay. I know what people are saying, but don't make no mistake, it is one of the religions represented on the planet. The word Christian shows up exactly three times in the New Testament. The word Christianity shows up exactly zero. The word disciple shows up 263 different times. It would be most accurate, church, for us to call ourselves disciples. Disciples are learners. Disciples are also unlearners. Disciples are people who are committed to leaving where they started and following the way his name is Jesus. The disciples would spend 18 years living with their rabbi, learning everything about them. It's relationship, it's encounter, it's development. It's letting go of old thinking, old programming, letting go of some religious thoughts, asking quality questions. We should not claim that Christianity is the ultimate truth. Rather, Christianity claims that Jesus Christ is the ultimate truth. And we're on a journey, an experiment of trying to figure out who he really is and how to communicate what that looks like. And if you're wondering, if, if you're pushed back on that at all, just think about how some of the things that the church has done in the past centuries that misunderstood scripture and abused people and did things that were not okay, that we don't do now because we're on the journey of going somewhere, understanding God better. Is God the same yesterday, today, and forever? Yes. But you seeing him in the fullness is going to take us forever. Jesus is the ultimate truth. Paul gives us a master class on what does it look like to interact with people in a mixed culture. 
you know, it is important when you read your Bible that you understand who it was written to, understanding the era, where we can extract a timeless truth. But in this particular encounter, Paul gives us a, a real close uh, experience to what I think it looks like to be commissioned into a culture that doesn't think like or believe just like us. In Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse number 18, philosophers of the teachings of Epicurus and others called Stoics debated with Paul. So Epicurus was a Greek philosopher who espoused a radical materialism uh, espoused to a radical materialism that claimed that people should live for pleasure and material gain. Kind of sounds like today, right? That the, 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 the common theme in, in, in the world, especially in the Western world, is all about pleasure and material gain. I think we can relate. The Stoics were, are people who believed that humans can only reach their full potential by reason, Principle and intellect. Strike two. I think that's exactly what we see in today's world as well. The opening verse here says that they debated with Paul. Can I just say, uh, we Christians have used the word debate as a safer word to cover up what we're actually doing, arguing and fighting, because it just, it just sounds better. You know, if you've ever had a disagreement with your spouse, for whatever reason, we Christians, we don't say we, we had a fight. Oh, no, we had a disagreement. All right, praise the Lord. <laughs> Sometimes my wife and I, we have fights. My point is this. Don't leave here thinking that we have brawls, okay? We're not, <laughs> not that. I'm just saying, trying to be real. It says that he debated with them. Do you know there's a difference between debating and arguing and fighting? If you argue and fight with somebody, the end result, someone has to win and someone has to lose. Would you agree? But if we're going to go into a debate, a conversation, it's not about me winning or losing. It's not about me waiting for you to stop talking so that I can just prove my point. Debating puts the issue in the middle and we listen and we observe and we share and we honor. And sometimes you, you find that you still stand where you th what you thought on to begin with, and other times, hmm, they might be right. The word here debate or debated in the Aramaic language, it means to wrestle with words. Church, we wrestle with words, not with people. Okay, let's keep reading. It says, when they heard him speak about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, what strange ideas is this babbler trying to present? Others said he's peddling some kind of foreign religion. Now, they didn't have social media in Paul's day, as far as I can tell. And I still see this human condition. When someone hears something new, there's a, there's a, an, a tendency when it sounds foreign, it sounds different, maybe even, maybe we wouldn't use the words, but maybe brings conviction. We tend to start with a jab. Has anyone have seen this on social media before? You're just trying to put a nice thought out there. You know, we're just talking real safe stuff, rainbows and unicorn kind of stuff. And you get some joker, some troll that wants to come along and just give you a gut punch on something. This is basically what's happening today. It's what was happening then. So how does Paul respond? Does he start a fight? No, he doesn't. So they brought him to uh, brought him for a public dialogue before the leadership council of Athens known as Areopagus. Now, Areopagus is also known as Mars Hill. It was a council of people overseeing the spiritual atmosphere of Athens. It could best be described as the Greek temple of human thought. The Aramaic here uses the phrase, the house of religion. What a real privilege this was that Paul, when he didn't respond to their insults, was invited to have a conversation at the highest level. Tell us, they said, about this new teaching that you're bringing to our city. You're presenting strange and astonishing things to our ears, and we want to know what it all means. Now, 
It was the favorite pastime of the Athenians and visitors to Athens to discuss the newest ideas and philosophies. So Paul's given his opportunity. So Paul stood in the middle of the leadership council and said, You immoral idiots! Oh, it doesn't say that. (laughs) Respected leaders of Athens. Wow. Paul gave honor not because of what they thought, what they did, or what they thought was honorable. Paul gave honor because he was honorable. When you're given the opportunity to share with people, lead with honor. Amen. Amen. Respected leaders of Athens, it's clear to me how extravagant you are in your worship of idols. For as I walked through your city, I was captivated by the many shrines and objects of your worship. I even found an inspiration on one altar that read to the unknown God. I've come to introduce you to to this God whom you worship without even knowing anything about him. The true God is the creator of all things. He's the owner and the Lord of the heavenly realm and the earthly realm, and he doesn't live in man-made temples. He supplies life and breath and all things to every living being. He doesn't lack a thing that, that we mortals could supply for him, for he has all things and everything he needs. From one man, Adam, he made every man and woman and every race of humanity, and he spread us over the earth. He sets the boundaries of people and nations, determining their appointed time in history. He's done this so that every person would long for God, feel their way to him, and find him. For he is the God who is easy to discover. It is through him that we live and function and have our identity. Just as your own poets have said, our lineage comes from him. This is a brilliant move because right here, Paul is quoting two of their their Greek poets, famous ones that they would have known. Can I tell you, church, I have been in living rooms. I've been around kitchen tables. I've been, I have been in ride-alongs in trucks. I've even sat on tractors with some of our local farmers so that I can have conversation and relationship with them. It's interesting when people will ask me questions or more specifically ask my children questions. Grace was telling me recently that someone came up to her and said, so what's it like in your house? Do you guys just pray all the time? (laughs) We could pray more, but we do other things than pray. It's amazing what, what people would think about me or box me in, and maybe they've boxed you in. And when I've actually experienced some things, Maybe I've read some material or authors or listened to people that they know. I know something more than just the Bible. So if we hang out, there's other things that we can talk about. I love talking about Scripture. I love talking about Jesus. But we can talk about farming. We can talk about automation. We can talk about fishing. Someone knew where I was going. (laughs) My point is this. If your interaction with somebody, remember we're called to to, the Great Commission. We're going. Nobody likes to feel like they're being sold something. So if all you know is your, your, your canned answers and your memorized scripts, that's not honoring to people. And it's not interesting. You just want to be heard. You want to convert them and move on. That's not, that's not the method, methodology of, of, of Jesus. So he quotes these famous Greek philosophers and poets. Since our lineage can be traced back to God, that original phrase, it actually means in the Aramaic language, since we are offspring of God. Since we are offspring of God or traced back to God, how could you even think that our divine image could be compared to something made of gold, silver, or stone sculpted by man's artwork and clever imagination? In the past, God tolerated our ignorance. Bad choice of words because it really, the, the original language means that he, he doesn't pay it any mind. If you've ever been around a two-year-old or a three-year-old, do you really think when they're mad and they say, I hate you? Do you think they really hate you? They don't know what they're saying. It's not that God tolerated anything. He just understood the level of our our immaturity. He says, God tolerated our ignorance of these things, but now the time of deception has passed away. He commands us all to repent and turn to God. 
For the appointed day has risen in which he's going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has designated. I'm going to pause here because I want you to know in the coming weeks, maybe months, I'm going to come back to that phrase but I just kind of want to seed it for a minute. Please notice, for the appointed day has risen in which he is going to judge the world in righteousness. Not according to sin, not according to condemnation. He's going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he's designated and the proof given to the world that God has chosen this man is this. He, talking about Jesus, resurrected him from among the dead. That is why he judges the world, not because of what you do, but because what Jesus has done, the perfect lamb of God who takes away the sin singular of the world. Good preaching. Now watch this. You've been commissioned. You're doing the stuff. You're having conversations. You're interacting with people. You're sharing your faith. And the moment you drop Jesus in resurrection, not everyone is going to respond as positively as you think they should. Oh, it's way safer to say universe, source, you, whatever. You start dropping resurrection of Jesus, you might get some people that, whoa, 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 whoa. I've heard this stuff before. The moment they heard Paul bring up the topic of resurrection, some of them ridiculed him. And then they got up and left. Some people are going to ridicule you. Some people are going to walk away from the conversation. Please don't be offended. Watch what else happens. But others said, I want to hear more. I want to hear you again later about these things. So Paul left the meeting, but there were some who believed the message and joined him from that day forward. Some people are going to ask more questions and want to journey with you. Others, depending on where they're at in their journey, they're just going to go, I got it. I want more of this. And some will walk with you. Some will join with you. Some will connect with your church. When Paul would pray, over the churches, very specifically in Ephesians chapter 1, almost an identical prayer in Colossians chapter 1. I think it's interesting to see how we prayed. And I think that this prayer is timeless. I think that the prayer of Paul, what he declares over the saints, is safe for me to declare over you. I believe this prayer of Paul is the same call to being open-minded all those centuries ago today. And watch what he says in his letter. Paul says, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. Watch this. Watch how he prays. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. One translation says, I pray that the eyes of your heart or your mind would be opened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the boundless greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. As we talk about the Great Commission, we need to understand that we're going somewhere. What we have, what we carry is precious. How we conduct ourselves, how we communicate, how we're open-minded even to being malleable, to growing. You don't know everything, Hot Rod. That's my self-talk. I don't know everything, but I want to know. And that desire, that hunger, I think will keep us humble. We'll treat people better. We'll, well, maybe we'll remember that there was a time in our lives that we didn't see as clear as we see today. And there was some areas that were darkened to us, but now we see it a little better. First Peter chapter 4 describes the grace of God as multifaceted, meaning there's more than just one angle. And as you journey, may that grace of God be like that gem that turns and now you see something more beautiful every single time. So I want to invite you to stand. I've asked Pastor Steve to pull out an older song. It's an oldie but a goodie. Probably familiar with it if you've been around Christian music for very long, but 
as I pray over you and we end with this song of worship, no matter where you're at in your journey today, if you're, uh, if you, you're new to it, if you're long in it, I remember sitting with a couple after they attended our church for a few months. It looked like this was going to be home for them. And, and we're talking. They, turns out they were lifelong church-attending Christians. And at the end of the conversation, I'm sitting in my office. I looked at the gentleman. And I said, sir, my experience tells me that you're not going to make it here. And his eyes got as big as saucers. Why would you say that? And I said, because it's such an eclectic blend, you can't assume anything. You can't be in a small group. You can't be in the commons. You can't even be sitting next to somebody and throw out a statement so definitive that they automatically believe or they've been taught the same thing. That's just not happening here. So we got to be graceful with people where they're at. And if you find, if you're finding yourself like I have been many times in the box, would you humble yourself and say, maybe there's more. Maybe, maybe this whole thing about Jesus is not something to be memorized. It's not, there's no test at the end. It's a relationship. And as we walk with him, we journey with him, may our eyes be opened to who he really is. Today, if you walked in here and you're seeking and you're wondering, is this real? Believers is a great church, but we're not perfect. But we know the one who is. And we know that if you'll trust him and you walk with him, your life will be changed forever. Father, across this room, it's my prayer that each one of us, no matter where we find ourselves, that this is an atmosphere that's ripe for the miraculous. The miracle working power to release our, our shame, our guilt, our past, and to receive your forgiveness and grace. The miracle working power to humble ourselves when we think we've got it all figured out. We're trusting in our own ability and intellect. Open the eyes of our heart that we'd really begin to see you. That this would be a, a supercharged environment that draws us to a place of courage to say yes to Jesus. To release the, the fears, the concerns, the intimidations. Release bondages and strongholds that the renewing breath of the Spirit of God would blow over us, blow on us, and touch us in a very intimate, particular way, each one. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.